Welcome back to Nature League. We are at beautiful Blue Mountain here in Missoula, Montana and have something really exciting for you all. I have teamed up with a friend here and we're gonna do a mini series all about climate change and philosophy. My name is Gray. I am a second year master's student in environmental philosophy here at the University of Montana. And we crossed paths, both had a shared interest in science communication and philosophy, and thus this idea was born. So as it turns out, we are literally in a new epoch. What does that even mean? We're talking geological times. So time scales even like more than our own lives can, can really comprehend. This one we're in right now, we've talked about on this show, is called the Anthropocene or Anthropocene. We disagree on this, but we're still gonna be friends. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> but this, this Anthropocene, which we can break that down and we have Anthropo, which is coming from a word meaning man, and then scene meaning new or recent. So we're saying that here's this kind of the newish or the newer uh, zone of time on earth. And it's really dominated by our species, by humans. And so the Anthropocene was actually coined in 2000 by scientists, by biologists, by geologists that are trying to denote this new epoch. But then it was adopted a little bit later by philosophers to describe something that's actually a little bit more. What is an epoch is a really good place to start. What is it really? Like, what is it uh, definitionally? Well, it is a functional and stratigraphical difference or designation um, based on a bunch of different types of indicators uh, that is going to designate one epoch from another epoch. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about stratigraphy. So we're thinking of the Latin word stratum, which is just layers. So it's saying, all right, here are the layers of Earth. Wait a second, is this one different? And uh, I can think of some ways that uh, the current human impact is actually literally writing in stone some differences. I mean, what are some that you can think of? From microplastics that are down at the bottom of mm -hmm. the lowest places on Earth all the way to the top of Mount Everest to uh, nuclear radiation that has made its way into multiple <laughs> levels of the rock. Like you can literally see when those bombs happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have written that, that is there for the rest of Earth's time. Like that is mind blowing. Do we have a consensus? Are we 100% sure we are in the Anthropocene? Does everyone agree? No, <laughs> I mean, no, right? Because there's so many ways to define things. And this is where philosophy comes in and is why I love having someone who's versed in philosophy to talk to, because if we're going to say right now is different, right now is um, there are things at stake, this is unlike stuff that's come before, uh, we really wanna know if that's true or not. I think that philosophers can really help out here because as it turns out, it's not strictly a geological uh, determination. It might also have to do with strategy and even rhetoric. What is it? How does that impact you ah. on an emotional or logical level when I say that we are in a geologically distinct age? Right. The synthetic age. I mean, right. Rhetoric. These words wind up mattering and they matter because they they themselves affect our behavior. So it's actually a designation that helps us to combat climate change and rhetorically. If scientists agree that we have altered the landscape in a way that we cannot reverse, that can help us to normalize the idea. Right, if we're saying, uh, here it is, different from everything before, let's now talk about action, that winds up making a difference. So philosophy and philosophers mm -hmm. uh, are approaching this um, analytically in a different way than scientists might. Talk to me about where philosophy is going to help or, or work inside of this. Absolutely. So we've gone over how this particular problem of the Anthropocene uh, is already far reaching beyond mm -hmm. the bounds of STEM fields, beyond the bounds of science. And so it requires a fair bit of clarification to get mm. our brains around these big and <laughs> arduous concepts. One of those concepts that really needs clarification <laughs> is nature. Ugh, I'm gonna have an existential crisis. I mean, it's so funny. The semester that I took philosophy of the Anthropocene, we started off with, you know, what is nature and got into the, the literature about people who have tried to clarify this. And I had just decided on Nature League as the name of the channel. <laughs> and I was like, it's all gone. Well, what is real? <laughs> as it turns out, it might actually all be gone. <laughs> So we have this thing, we have nature, right. and is it even helpful to talk about nature as distinctly different from humans? We talk about things like biodiversity, we talk about things like health and ecosystems, mm -hmm. and these all come into this category, this conversation about nature. We're worried about nature, right? but what does this even mean? 
humans, like you said, might be a part of nature. Mm-hmm. We'd like to think we are. We're animals, right? right? But we have folks like Bill McKibben, a famous conservationist and an author who say, well, it's the end of nature, this big claim. We have ended nature. And that's a bit like saying that we've denoted the Anthropocene, right. that there is no pristine natural wilderness. Did that ever exist in the first place? Right. Is it even useful to talk about that when we talk about conservation goals? Because are we going to go back to that? Is there even that to go back to? <laughs> These are the questions that philosophers yeah. are asking in helping to clarify what it means when we talk about nature in regards to climate change. Right, because nature is the thing at stake. And if you can't really define what's at stake, how can you possibly make choices to help out the thing that you think is at stake? And it's funny that we would talk about wilderness here. (laughs) In Montana. Montana. We are the closest to registered wilderness that you can pretty much get in civilization, uh, in the U.S., that is. But I mean, at the same time, this is a built environment. Like, we have built on it. If you zoom out way far that way, you might see something a beaver has built on it. Like, you know, there are species building things, and those things might look different. But to say one is separate from the other is maybe not so useful if we're trying to really think strategically about climate change and what's at stake. In this place in particular, too, we are close to a lot of indigenous communities. Right who interact with the land in a very different way than you and I do. Yeah, absolutely. And so they are also stakeholders. What do those stakes mean for those communities that could be completely affected differently by climate change? And if you think globally, there are communities that are way more at risk to experience the effects of climate change um, and their relationship and what they might call nature or what's at stake could be totally different than ours. So all of this is included when we talk about things like the Anthropocene. When we designate this geological epoch, philosophers are telling us that we need to talk about nature (laughs) and Bill McKibben and how humans are a part of nature, or maybe they're not a part of nature. These are the things that philosophers bring to the table that are more than the functional and stratigraphical differences that designate epochs. So if we really are in the Anthropocene, in an age that is distinctly different from how it has ever been in the history of the world, Mm -hmm. we should probably do something about it. (laughs) I mean, that feels fair. Philosophy can help us to clarify our responsibilities Mm -hmm. to non-human others, to ecosystems, to the environment in the face of problems like climate change. Because the words that we use, like Anthropocene, Anthropocene. I'm going to keep saying it. Anthropocene. They matter. They absolutely matter. Right. And they'll change the way that we inform our policies, Mm -hmm. that people like you and I, uh, non (laughs) policymakers, are going to think about the environment. I'm going to go write a policy. Watch me. (laughs) And the way that science in general is communicated, because it is scientists who are making the denotation of the Anthropocene. Yeah. And whether or not we acknowledge and accept an Anthropocene is really going to shape the earth and the world moving forward. 